Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar, Insights from the First Australian Local Fire Lodgements. I'm Bianca and I'll be a moderator today. Your presenters today from Walters Kluwer are Jim Edwards, Director for Corporate Reporting Solutions, Daniel Levin, Solutions Enablement Leader, and Grace Lim, Product Manager. In today's webinar, Jim, Grace and, and Daniel will be sharing insights gained from the first local fire lodgement submitted to the ATO and how technology has been used by corporations to streamline and simplify their Australian local file obligations. You can submit questions via the questions tab at any time throughout the webinar. Due to the limited time available to present, we will respond to all questions post the webinar. I think we're ready to begin, so I'll hand you over to Jim, Daniel and Grace. Thanks, Bianca. Welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar on our first insight session post the first lodgement series of local files in August. Today what we wanted to do was uh, cover off of the agenda for today is to talk through each of our experiences through what we've seen in the local file. Um, uh, so effectively have a bit of a recap on local file lodgements, um, insights from that local file, um, and then specifically how technology can help you streamline and automate that process to um, lodge successfully on time uh, to the ATO to mitigate uh, these hugely increased failure to, lodgement, uh, failure to lodge penalties from the ATO. Okay, so I think probably the first thing to do is do a little bit of a recap of what these specific requirements are. And I think, Grace, you're probably in a, a really good position being a, our product manager and owner of all things local file related. So, so what would you say, um, or how would you summarise some of these requirements and how they've differentiated from the international dealing schedule? Thanks, Daniel. Um, so, from the from the from the slides, you can see there are some three components to the local file Australian local file requirements. The first being the local file short form. Um, that being said, the data format that we use are you know, typically descriptive text. Um, as you can see, that local file short form uh, is a content uh, of your five aspects of your Australian business's description, um, covering your structure strategy, organizational structure, business restructuring, transaction, transfer of in intangibles transaction as well as the list of your key competitors. As for local file part A, it is um, a substitute of a section A of the in international dealing schedule. Having said so, um, the detail required in local file part A is much more uh, granular compared to income earned from the IDS. Uh, as we can see later on, on the challenges that most of the taxpayers are facing preparing local file part A. Now, local file part B is a great um, good surprise from the ATO, uh, <laughs> as it is, it is really something that's brand new that's been introduced. Um, generally, it is in line with the OECD local file guidelines in providing supporting agreements, APA or rulings. Uh, however, there are a lot more granular questions and confirmations and you know, trying to drill down into where you get the information from and can you get it from overseas and if not, then can you give it to them um, locally here in Australia. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's really interesting too is that um, a lot of corporations we've been speaking to have felt that the local file is really like an IDS on steroids. But I think as many corporates and service firms as well have delved into the detail of the local file, it's, it's much more than that. As Grace was touching on, the local file Part B requirements are brand new. You've never had to provide international related party agreements um, met, well, in a mandatory fashion to the ATO previously before. It may be through some negotiations through a, maybe an APA or a risk review or audit, but, but never actually having to um, file these things with um, as a particularly mandatory requirement electronically to the ATO. The other thing too is taking a step back from all of this, um, I think a lot of taxpayers have always wondered why has the ATO deviated so significantly with their Australian local file versus what the OECD set out in September 2014. And interestingly, when you look at the requirements, the short form is the only aspect to the OECD local file which has been lifted directly from those requirements. The rest of it is, is specifically Australian-centric. And the reason why, I think you probably would agree with this, Grace, is that um, a lot of the requirements in the existing TP documentation requirements in Australia overlap with some of the OECD local file requirements. So the ATO thought, well, we don't want to make taxpayers do the same thing twice, but we'll just give them more to do. <laughs> <laughs> what a great resolution. Absolutely. Now, if we can have a, another perspective into the Australian CBC reporting timeline, um, we have presented this prior to this uh, webinar, 
that you know taking December year end this early balance uh, as an example, taxpayers may elect the administrative concession to lodge their local file Part A together with the income tax return, uh, and the due date was 15 of August past. Uh, the rest of the CBC reporting, including the rest of the local file, short form Part B, must file, and if applicable, CBC report must then be filed by 31st of December this year, giving taxpayers a full 12 month period to prepare and lodge their CBC reporting. Now this timeline leads us to the next slide on you know, assessing where we're at now. Yeah, and I think I think before we just jump into the next slide, I think what I would say is when you look at the timing really um, over the next 12 months or so, you're going to find that all taxpayers will be lodging some form of compliance to the ATO. So whether you're an inbound lodging short form or just the full local file or whether you're an outbound lodging or three components of CBC reporting, um, subject to whether you're a parent surrogate in that rare case. I think we're going to see a lot of these, these requirements being lodged finally to the ATO. There's no time to really wait around much anymore. No. Um, yeah. And and the other thing we've, we have uh, witnessed too, as we've been through the July lodgements, is that uh, those December uh, year-end or early balances, um, around about 20% of, uh, of those December year-end organisations went through the process of, of substituting Part A of the IDS um, with, uh, yeah, with, with the local file submission. So there's still a significant portion uh, of early balances that have deferred uh, and have lodged an IDS uh, and then will equally have to then lodge a local file for the same accounting period. Yeah, and it's interesting because those 31 to 70 years probably make up the majority of local file lodgements in Australia. Absolutely. When you really look at the Australian economy being so inbound centric, yep. um, I think that's, the December is going to be a very busy period for everyone. Correct. And I thought that December was meant for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, you think so at the ATO, right? I mean, 31 December, who's, who's there receiving local files on the 31st of December? <laughs> uh, that's quite interesting. Well, the highlight of this slide, as you know, well we've discussed earlier, is that you know, just want to bring you to the arrow to show that where we're at today. And you know, approximately, we have slightly a little bit more than um, 100 days. I would, I would just round it up to the 100 days to 31st of December, following due date. Um, when you think about it, Daniel, there's not, many, not much time left. No, not at all. I mean, it's really interesting. I think you and I have met with a lot of corporates and it's really crept up on everyone. Uh, I think earlier in the year, we were doing a lot of education. Jim and I were doing a lot of education in the market around what these requirements are. But as, as usually is the case with new compliance, um, everyone wants to sort of wait and see what and wait for things to be finalised. I mean, the FX guidance, which we'll touch on a bit later, was only finalised very late by the ATO. A very controversial um, new transaction that needs to be disclosed. And I think what I'm finding now, meeting with a lot of corporates, is everyone's in a little mini panic mode. They need to collect yeah. their data, they need to get reconcile it, they need to gather their agreements, and then they're also still, in many cases, inbounds waiting on their master files to be prepared overseas, yep. okay. so they can lodge it some time. Yep. So I guess the theme that I would probably say to most of you that are listening on this, there's no more time to wait. You, you really do need to get your data collected and get prepared as soon as possible. Yeah, and work out how you're going to submit over the wire to the ATO as well. I think a lot of people, as you said there before, have been holding back and waiting for um, hopefully a bit of demystification of some of the ATO's instructions on how to submit um, and equally then trying to work out how to actually source uh, software so that you can actually submit in the, uh, in the in the mandated required format from the ATO. So now that so solutions are more uh, prevalent and available um, and, and people are already using them successfully. I think people are now in a much more confident position to go on, um, you know, acquire them into their businesses and, uh, and, and use them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually a really good point because I think so many people have struggled to depart from that, that normal piece of stationary form that's deployed yeah. in the IDS mm -hmm. to something that, you know, I think a lot of taxpayers have still felt, but how do I generate that XML? Mm. You know, not realizing that the actual software generates it, but it's a case of, okay, what disclosures do I need to focus on that differentiate from the IDS now and what do they look like? So people have been going to the ATO website and scrambling and trying to put together these disclosures. Yep. Absolutely. Now, talking about ATO disclosure and guidelines, what's new? Um, I think we've touched uh, a little bit earlier on uh, the new instructions. Finally, we have a very big, more than 100 pages of the local file instructions issued by the ATO carving both Part A and Part B. Um, these are the very, very detailed instructions based on each of the scenarios provided by the ATO. Now, on top of that, a very late piece that was released just prior to the 
um, 15th of August deadline was the foreign exchange reporting guidelines in part A of the local file. I shall not dwell too much into this today. Um, as you can see, these guidance, uh, these guidelines and documents are available on ATO's website. Yeah, I think the thing what we probably would touch on though is that um, a lot of corporates have found it very challenging who need to lodge a local file. I think the, the yeah. ethics and gain losses on the IDS, but as you know, that's aggregated data, whereas this is all disaggregated. And you know, Jim and we've discussed this at length that accounting systems at, at firms that, or at corporates are just not configured and designed no. to be able to source this on a transactional basis. No, no, one's, no one's converting transactional level accounts uh, across to reporting currency to local. So, uh, and even on aggregate form, it's then difficult to then derive that information. So I think the ATO have offered a concession, haven't they, for, they have. for the early balances? Yeah. They have, they have. And I think a lot of it is best efforts for, for year one. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly going to be some more discussions between industry and, and the ATO going forward into year two and beyond as to how this should actually be reported and disclosed. Yeah. And more importantly, how this information should be recorded, uh, kept in their, you know, the ERP or SAP or even any other system data that taxpayers traditionally do not keep track of. Mm, yep, agreed. So come to your early lodgement insights. Now during the past local file part A administrative election filing period, which end by the 15th of August, we have the largest number of uh, lodgement come through CCH integrator. Mm. Um, and this period leading up, in the period leading up to the lodgement deadline, we have observed some common challenges shared by the market, and uh, some first-hand feedback from our users on how we have helped them. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting actually. So we've got a, a really good cross section of um, in uh, of inbound uh, multinational corporations mm -hmm. uh, that have already submitted now um, directly through um, through our software. Uh, a lot of uh, inbound corporations, of course, with minor operations in Australia, have outsourced. Uh, and been through the service firm, so equally, you know, got a couple of hundred uh, submissions that have gone through the service firm lodgement channels as well. So, yeah, on aggregate, then quite quite some uh, interesting insights that have been gained. But what was good was we had uh, overall, I think, a pretty successful first period. I think that that was good. I think there was a lot of nervousness um, mm. going through with with the first part, but I think uh, it was a good uh, successful period with part A. I think you were doing a lot of the validations and building of validations. I think we built. Lots more validations than what we actually published. Absolutely, easily triple the triple the number of the validation rules provided by the ATO. Yeah, yeah. Right. and it's absolutely critical those validation rules because what that does is it provides you as taxpayers with the the comfort that what you're lodging is correct before you lodge it to the tax office. Exactly. Now, among the, an array of the challenges, you know, unique or general faced by the taxpayers and advisors that we have here. Now we've selected um, and summarized into the pain points into these three main areas. As you can see on the screen, um, the three areas are compliance requirements, data transformation, as well as the transparency and control. Um, Dan, would you like to have a have a chat about the increase in the compliance requirements of a local file and compared to the IDS? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think when you look at Part A, um, there is a lot of similarities between Part A and questions 2 to 17 in Section A of the IDS. I think the main overarching statement I probably make there is that the information is now more is reported at a more just aggregated level. So as you're building up to preparing your IDS, normally in your in your work papers or your your collection template that you might be preparing, um, that data would or that that information that you would otherwise be prepared be preparing for your IDS is now being disclosed to the tax office. So by way of example. You're now disclosing on that transactional basis the name of the counterparty to the to, to the to the transaction and the actual party itself, the reporting party in Australia, the country of origin of that particular transaction, um, and so you know now it's just more granular information that you're reporting uh, to the ATO. There's also these new transactions like FX gains and losses, um, so it, it is a lot more data that you're actually disclosing, and the ATO wants that so they can mine it and do some analytics internally yep. to, for review and audit purposes. Yeah, agree. In in the IDS disclosure, it's historically um, very country focused. So most of the transactions and you know are aggregated based on you know, country or tax jurisdiction instead of by counterparty or entity base. Now in local file one of the biggest difference that you know, or biggest hit that taxpayers are feeling is that they need to then dissect or se segregate the um, 
the, the amount of uh, related party dealings by entities mm. per tax jurisdiction. And that would pose some of the greatest challenge to some people who historically do not collect data in such a way. Exactly. So like it or not, and in my opinion, this has inevitably increased the taxpayer's burden of compliance. Uh, some of these entities basically do not maintain these kind of records and they have to now drill down into the details. Yeah, yeah. And I think that probably brings us to the second point there around the need to transform data and the amount of energy that has to go into collecting and aggregating and then transposing this information uh, into a format that's then ready for submission to the ATO, but equally reconciled to ensure that it's accurate and that you, be, you can be confident that when you're eventually and inevitably asked the question from the ATO, that you can understand how it's been prepared. So I think one of the, um, uh, one of our um, learnings from this process, I guess, or key observations has been um, the amount of energy that's spent in trying to gather information from these disparate source systems that capture uh, all the various uh, inter intercompany transactions um, and the amount of uh, manipulation that needs to be performed on that data uh, in order to then aggregate it to that appropriate level um, of by legal entity by transaction type. Um, and and it, okay, there's no two corporations that are the same in that regard. I think everyone's got a different source system their data is, uh, you know, sometimes it's been coded in a, in, a, in a more friendly manner back in the APAR system to f facilitate um, the data summarization, but more often than not, it's not. So therefore, that leads itself to a lot of manipulation um, through spreadsheets uh, and then collection of the, the data via email. I think the other thing too, there's some practical issues too. So, you know, with those new requirements, the Part B requirements around agreements, for example, mm. I think there's, there was a common held view that, oh, can't be that difficult to sort intercompany legal agreements. They must be readily available on, like, you know, some sort of document management tool <laughs> system around. But I think in reality, as most corporates would appreciate, these things don't necessarily exist. And you know, there's been a lot of effort and uh, put in to try and source these agreements. Absolutely. You know, from either, you know, headquarter parent or some other subs around the world. Yep. Um, are they in the right sort of format? Uh, which yep. we'll get to later on in terms of how you submit these things. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of pragmatic issues. Yeah, and actually, yeah. that's a, that raises a point too that you know, I think in these uh, the early balance of submission as well, there was very few, if any, yep. Part B attachments submitted through the ATO. Oh, very. I think that was the, the real challenge. I think most people are still trying to gather all of these to yep. make sure they're right and how you how you link them to the transactions exactly. as well. So, yeah. yeah. Now, not, now, with the increased compliance requirements that we talked about just now and the, you know, the data transformation challenges, um, it is natural for taxpayers that, and advisors alike to be wanting more transparency and control into this reporting data and the processes. Now, as we mentioned just now earlier, that you know, with a very public display of the tax authority around them challenging the international related party dealings these days, um, you know, the risk of not knowing the origin and the facts behind your reported disclosure will be more and more uh, risky. Mm, um, yeah. The risk has definitely increased. Yeah enhance you know, the importance of the transparency and control and which has been acknowledged. Yeah, and I think that's that's motivated a lot of the corporation to 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 want to actually have direct control over the the software submission themselves as well. So yeah, you know, there's probably a lot of smaller organizations that perhaps um, you know have, have gone down the path of, of outsourcing, but a lot of them I think have said, I, I need to be able to see the detail. I need to be able to see how I've derived that information, what was disclosed, so I'm ready to defend myself when I get asked the question. Now, using our with our in depth understanding of the market you know, from day one, and you know understanding how most of our clients, taxpayers alike, undertake the process of IDEA compliance, you know, we have come up with an end to end solution. You know, mainly duplicates most of our clients' current processes, not changing too much of their current processes, mm -hmm. with enhanced automation that replace manual workings and minimize human in intervention. And we know that this process typically starts with data sourcing, as we mentioned just now, yep. um, in the form of system-generated or unstructured data. Now, such data traditionally are cleansed and processed using Excel um, application, but these processes can now be replaced by a robotic data transformation application called Bob the Robot. Now, some of you have known Bob the Robot from our <laughs> previous webinar or in a free interaction with us. This is this Bob the Robot is capable of duplicating both the documented and logical-driven steps to produce your local file disclosure required by ATO. 
So following that, you know, coming to that, um, additional lodgement information, document attachment, and output from Bob can be collated in the cloud-based um, CCH integrated platform. And in this platform, you can easily work with both internal and external stakeholders with a well-defined access, roles, and fu uh, functions um, iteration. Now, last but not least, post your report data validation, as we mentioned earlier, um, user can launch their in Australian local file report with a click of a button. Now, with the aim to receive a successful lodgement receipt for a record keeping. That, that lodgement you know, through us is through the SBR software. Yep. And at the end of the process after submission, you've then got that clear audit trail as, as to That's what right. data was collected, how it was transformed, exactly. the additional annotations and attachments, yep. uh, and then the final submission. Exactly. And we, from our findings um, in the market that this application of you know, our clients' familiar processes but using solution um, actually helps our clients to adapt or adopt this technology in a very fast manner mm. uh, with a, providing them with great experiences as well. Yep. And actually one thing that's been interesting too, and probably not surprising, is that a lot of people due to the, um, you know, just the, the lack of time that they have and, and, uh, and the challenges they have with source data systems is the, um, you know, a number of corporations have adopted and implemented the data transformation component there to, to so I guess taking the opportunity of this new compliance obligation to try and automate that process of data collection and transformation. But equally, there's a number of corporations that said, uh, look, I don't have time to do that this year. I really just need to get the submission through. Um, I recognise the value of automation of that transformation, but let's not force it right yet. Let's, yeah. let's do that in year two. Um, and that's fine. Um, our solution's flexible enough to support either. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've catered this for the timing, the tight timing on all of this, I think. Yeah, and on top of that, we believe that you know, transformation takes time yeah. mm. and the readiness of, uh, of the stakeholders as well. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's probably a good time to start going through a bit of a walkthrough. Yeah, let's have a walkthrough. Um, we have, you know, during our market interaction, it has come to our light that some of our um, clients or the contacts are unsure of the disclosure required for local file part A and part B. So, in answer for that, let's have a walkthrough on you know, what is required by the ATO in the local file part A and part B. Now, let's, starting from local file part A, taxpayers are required to characterize their transactions, um, whether it's a type of transaction, is it part of the RAS, and how many transactions are part of the RAS, um, followed by providing the identification of the Australian counterparty to the transaction. Um, that is from the Australian side of things. And the name of our non-resident counterparties, these are the international related parties that you're dealing with uh, for this particular transaction. Amount of considerations are then required but separating by capital nature and non-capital nature, in other words, revenue nature. Amount of foreign exchange gains or losses are also required per each of these transactions. Now, on top of that, there are some questions with regard to non-monetary consideration for both capital and revenue nature. It's a yes-no answer, so you don't have to really value your non-monetary um, expenditure consideration. TP methodology applied and level of TP documentation prepared uh, similar to the IDS requirements are still required here. Now, with an additional list of a question at the end to come as a surprise. Um, a series of a special short-term tenor rules indicators for ordinary ordinary loans, derivatives, and FX derivatives. OB activities needs to be indicated here. OB meaning or, uh, overseas banking, uh, offshore banking. Exclusion list and the category of the exclusion list applicable for the transactions are required in Part A, and these will determine whether or not you need to complete the whole of the Part B in the next section. Now, with the Part B, although there are you know, 17 questions altogether, but the requirements are pretty standard. Coming from TP methodology applied by the international counterparty, this is brand new. And followed by written agreements provision and other relevant questions to it. A similar set of questions are also included for amended agreements and APA or rulings. Now, last but not least, 
In completing Australian local file, uh, taxpayers should also provide short form documents as well as the reporting entity's financial account. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting looking at this on screen, Grace, because I don't know, I think we've both experienced this from meeting lots of corporates. Is a lot of people have struggled to really, as I mentioned earlier in this, in this um, session, uh, really try and make sense of what the disclosures look like. So what you're seeing on screen are the future local file disclosures. This is your new RDS in the future. So what you have is a two-dimensional grid of all of these particular drop-downs where you've got a complete uh, responses to these questions and you can see as what Grace was touching on before with Part A, a lot of them are very similar to what you're used to in, in Section A of your idea, so the non-monetary considerations, the revenue and capital transaction types. But then there's some new questions, whether they apply to specifically FS, um, FS, the FS industry mm -hmm. or, or um, there might be some new transaction types like the FS gains and losses, exactly. um, the agreements. But I think when you take a step back, how do you look at the local file? Well, you've got data and numeric transactions that are being disclosed here, yep. and then you have a series of attachments. Absolutely. As, as you know, so the short form is, while there's qualitative text to describe your local business, it's being produced and submitted in the attachment form. Absolutely. And another point to consider here is just the, um, the, the sheer volume of information that's having mm -hmm. to be collected and disclosed down through to the ATO. So I think the number of attributes across Part A and Part B was 40 or 50. Yeah, so 47. 47 fields of, of, wow. of data per transaction. Now, for the for the many corporations that we've spoken to, both inbound and outbound, obviously the outbounds have a higher volume generally of, of transactions. Some of those outbound uh, larger multinationals, we're talking about in the high hundreds, possibly even close to a thousand transactions. So, thousand times 47 attributes. So, significant number of attributes having to be collected and disclosed, and that's where. Obviously, we're having to talk to them about how you automate this process because exactly. you know, going through and completing this by hand is just uh, you know would be uh, impossible. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we've heard of some corporations, some of the larger end of town, have got thousands of attachments to. Absolutely, well. absolutely. So it, it yeah. is a significant burden. Yeah. Yes. So the good thing is that through our solution, of course, we've got lots of uh, automation capabilities that so importing this data from external sources, uh, removing the need for people that have to go through and manually select these things. Exactly. Now, talking about attachments, <laughs> there's Plenty of questions that we've collected in the market these days about you know, what are the document types that I can attach or can be, can be submitted. Um, are there any file size limitations? Hmm. No. Um, based on our understanding from the ATO, there are some insights provided by them on top of their guidance, of course, um, particularly on the file size limitation. Per attachment, you know, there is a file size limitation of 20 megabytes. Now, that 20 megabytes is including transforming or translating your document into a binary format. Um, from our experience, that would take another few megabytes, right. 20 yep. to 30 percent more. Yep. So something just to be mindful of, a practical example, if you've got a scanned PDF document, often scanned documents are higher in their, their megabyte size, so you might want to actually reduce the um, uh, the resolution of those PDF documents. So yeah, just ensure that they're less than 20 megabytes. Yeah, and as for our clients who have thousands of attachments, mm -hmm. there's a there's a limitation per lodgement that they can make that is one gigabyte. Absolutely, but that one gigabyte is really important too because if you were submitting this through those port of manual portals, which is the, the business and tax agent oh. portals, mm -hmm. there is I actually have actually published exceptionally long wait times just to try and submit. Yeah, mm -hmm. and when you're dealing with hours, hours yeah. exactly right. Mm -hmm. So. When you're dealing with potential penalties that are that you know with lodging right up to the last minute, you don't want to be submitting through those portals. You want to be Absolutely. submitting through a machine-based portal like SBR, which yeah. is how Integrator submits this information. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So I think there's a real concern about what's going to happen at the end of the year when we get close to 31 December and you've got these significant documents being pushed through that portal, where historically we know we've had lots of technology issues with submitting data through the ATO. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. Yeah, so, so yeah, we're really, really hoping that lots of corporations are starting early uh, and submitting uh, as early as possible. And while there's lots, of, lots of different document types, I think the most common one is PDF. I think we've refined from corporates because it's a read-only format. So while you might prepare some of your responses in Word or Excel, ultimately you'd probably convert it to PDF and then attach it in that format. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not to forget about the file name, characters, limitation as mm -hmm. well. Of course, and uh, unlikely that any of the users or taxpayers will have more than 255 characters, but yep. just so you know that do not use a, a computer generated file names, which can go up to hundreds. Yep. Okay. I think. All right, well, thank you very much. I think that probably brings us to the closure of this, uh, this session. Um, so I think, you know, thank you for your time, everyone. We'd like you to um, please contact us if you've got any questions in relation to what we've covered today. 
Um, certainly, we are, we're here to help uh, manage your Australian local file requirements and are happy to provide you with some more insights into how our solution may be able to uh, benefit you and lead up to these very tight timelines. And there's some contact details provided on that slide. Yep. So thanks, everyone, and good luck with your lodgements. See ya. Bye-bye. Thanks to Jim, Daniel, and Grace for today's webinar. And um, to all our attendees, hope you have a great day.